distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning once again and a warm welcome to the 2020 Asia Economic and Entrepreneurship Summit organized by KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, the Pacific Basin Economic Council, and China Daily Asia Pacific, with the team, Growing Partnership for Inclusive, Innovative, and Sustainable Growth. We are pleased to welcome our first panel of the session entitled The Future of Asia-Pacific Economic Co Cooperation in a Sustainable VUCA World. What to expect and what next? Role players for this session are all joining us online via Zoom. We have Mr. Ian Buchanan, Emeritus Chair of the Australia National Committee for Asia for Pacific Economic Cooperation Australia, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, Distinguished Fellow at Gateway House, the Indian Council for Global Relations in India, Professor Xiao Geng, Chairman of, of the Hong Kong Institution for International Finance Hong Kong, Dr. Eden Woon, President of the Asian Institute of Technology Thailand, Mr. Go Peng Oi, Executive Chairman of Civil Access. Moderating this session is Ms. Penny Bird, Group CEO of the Asia Link Center, Australia. Without further ado, I'd like you to welcome all our panel members who are joining us on Zoom. Let's give them a loud round of applause. I'd like to hand the time over to Ms. Penny Bird. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. And let me say how delighted both myself and all of our panelists are to be joining you today virtually. Um, as you know, our very first session this morning is looking at the future of Asia Pacific economic cooperation in a sustainable and VUCA world. Today, our very distinguished panel, which includes representatives of business, academia, think tanks with experience in government, and most importantly, business, are actually going to explore a range of issues. First, we're going to look at some of the history of Asia-Pacific economic cooperation. Um, then we're going to look at the opportunities for expanded and enhanced collaboration in economic integration in the region as we transition through this very challenging time of the global pandemic. Most importantly, we're going to look at the way in which collaboration can unlock new business opportunities. With Malaysia chairing APEC this year, there's been a very strong focus at the Asia Pacific level on deepening economic integration as an important driver of economic recovery. At the same time, Malaysia, as a PEC chair, has actually highlighted the importance of the digital economy and technology to our future recovery and growth, as well as the need for inclusive growth and both innovation and sustainability as we move forward. I would lastly say that one of the most important things too, as we look forward um, to the future of growth in the region, is also understanding the broader geostrategic context mm -hmm. in which we're all going to be navigating an uncertain future. So um, we've had our panel introduced broadly. Let me, with that, um, invite Mr. Ian Buchanan, the Chair Emeritus of the um, Australian National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperation from Australia, joining us from Sydney this morning, um, kick off our discussion this morning. Thank you, Ian. Very good. Thank you very much, Penny. So, Sana Pagi um, As the first speaker, and with only seven minutes each, we've agreed that my role is to draw on the 48 years experience I've had working with governments and corporations throughout the region to set the stage. Two things, brief perspective on VUCA as a framework, and secondly, to offer a geopolitical and economic context for the miracle which led to massive changes in regional architecture and what happens now. So first, very briefly, VUCA. Uh, VUCA stands, as I'm sure you've all read, Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. This is an acronym that's been used for decades by the military, popularized for business by leadership professor Warren Bennis back in 1987. Given we're short of time uh, and with no disrespect to Professor Bennis, let me summarize by saying I am personally aligned with the uh, 2014 Harvard Business Review article, 
uh, which argued that the four dimensions of VUCA are descriptive, not predictive, and they're also not strategically distinct. Given this, VUCA is probably not the best framework for this panel. And to guide our discussions, therefore, let me provide a context. So Penny's asked me to draw on the experience, and that includes first the World Bank, then Stanford Research Institute, Booz Allen, for strategic advisory work uh, for business and government. And my philosophy, which has underpinned that, is what I would call George Santayana's belief that those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. So the plan now is to revisit the main drivers of Asian miracle growth and then look at regional developments. And also we can't avoid in discussing this, uh, the election of President US Trump, US President Trump in January 27, which will have a significant effect on future APEC cooperation. So in order that we can discuss future cooperation, we first have to understand the historical context and what drove the existing architectures. A lot of this arose during the Asian so-called miracle growth era. And that growth, as those of you who attended prior talks or read the articles, was neither Asian nor a miracle, but it did happen as a result of larger geopolitical forces as we're experiencing now, and it did take place in three distinct waves. Challenge for the panel today is how we in the region preserve the productive cooperation of those so-called miracle years which brought the region together, uh, which brought so many people in the region out of poverty, while simultaneously reinventing our regional architectures to reflect a far different and far more challenging US and international geopolitical order. So as a starting point, I'll select two key lessons from that Asian miracle period, which may help us frame the issues going forward. Number one, I'll argue there was no miracle because there is no monot there is no Asia. Our, it, our region was and is a complex portfolio of countries and economies, very different stages of development, diverse political and economic systems, and massively shaped by geopolitics, globalization, and decolonization. Second point is that while there was no miracle, the high regional post-World War II growth did depend upon a confident and internationally engaged United States. This can't be overstated. At that stage, US accounted for 50% of global output, and it was committed and critically as part of its own security to support reconstruction of its key allies after World War II, including new ally Japan. This process created a new world order built on three pillars. The first pillar was a completely new global institutional architecture, which we are now in the process of being forced to reinvent. Secondly, it was built on new and more open trade policies, which unlike the autarky of the 1930s, offered access to that huge US market to its new Asian allies. This was crucial and that's disappearing. This post-World War II, an US-led Cold War policy framework, it contributed to rapid growth in global trade and investment flows at a time when many of the developing Asian economies were still mostly autarkic, including Malaysia, i.e. closed and import substituting. And the eight globally integrating high-performance Asian economies, which became the subject of the World Bank's 1993 report, were the ones that ultimately drove that Asian miracle. It was a very small subset of the Asian economies, which became the East Asian miracle. So early regional cooperation during that era included the creation of many new institutions, new technologies and massive technology innovation, and new market access. Taken together, these shrank the globe, not just the region, and helped create global integration and the rapid growth of multinationals. These became central to the wave one globalization of supply chains. It was that globalization of supply chains which led to the distribution of wealth around the region. And it led to dramatic increases in global trade, which post-World War II grew at three times the rate of global GDP. We can no longer uh, depend on those conditions to drive the growth going forward. So to reap the full benefit of globalization, it required historically that countries cooperated, and this leads to architectures, to reduce barriers to trade and investment, and the early winners were the ones who initially adopted the labor-intensive export-oriented industrialization growth model. 
they were mostly the resource poor countries of, of Asia that did not have um, other options. Uh, while globalization was the engine of wave one and of Asia's miracle growth, we were already running out of steam after the second 1979 oil price shock. It could have died after the end of the Cold War, but it was revitalized by a new wave of market-based MNC-driven complete reinvention of global supply chains as transport as costs dropped and speed increased. And it was further boosted by then, then the most unlikely source, uh, China. So in 1978, Deng Xiaoping's four modernizations revitalized that miracle growth. And along with the subsequent impact of the Plaza Accord, which led to rapid appreciation of the yen, drove dramatic investment into Southeast Asia to maintain our growth there uh, from North Asia. This led to... Yeah. This led to dramatic increases in foreign direct investment in the region and with record wave one and wave two growth rates between 65 and 90, the 23 economies of the World Bank's East Asia region grew faster than any other world, world region, leading to the Asian Miracle Report. So if both the key lessons for us in moving to conclusion, both wave one and wave two growth were driven by two big external surf waves, which enabled geographic separation of markets from production. This was dramatic. However, the, the benefits of these two waves were asymmetric. Consumers worldwide benefited, but in developing Asia, most of the benefit went to the early adopters, the high growth Asian economies, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Korea, Malaysia was second wave. They embraced new policies and new institutional architectures, including political architectures, faster than any other region. So where are we now? This post-war geopolitical condition enabled a global and regional division of labor, accelerated transfer of skills, a rapidly growing technology base, and new forms of economic architecture. Creatively, these created the exogenous drivers of growth, and that led to massive productivity increase and growing participation in global economic growth. However, we're no longer in a bipolar world, we no longer have a dominant United States unified in the face of perceived global communist threat and committed to opening its domestic market. We're already experiencing the South and East Asia season in experiencing unrest in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and in Syria, the US pulling back from its strategic role. Under its current leadership, the US is no longer willing or able to be a global guarantor of freedom. This is a huge challenge for all of us in the region. It doesn't guarantee freedom of the skies, the seas, or the emerging democracies, fundamental. The shift away from US dominance is also apparent in the crucial global institutional architecture for trade and investment. And in particular, the failure to conclude the Doha round has led to a much weakened WTO. So as global trade rounds have stalled, APEC countries have responded with a commitment to open regionalism. This has led to an explosion of complex multilateral trade agreements. Economists in 2003 labeled them noodle soup. And this reflects in part different historical and cultural groupings. So what next? How do we ignite a wave three growth model, which not only rebalances policy, but rebalances excessive emphasis on the single instrument of trade policy? We must invest in more evidence-based approaches to enhance behind the border reforms and political reform throughout the region, complex, sensitive, and beyond the scope of this paper. So given I started this analysis with an assertion that there was no Asia, it's clear there can be no single answer, no Asian answer to this. And after 48 years in the region, uh, my, my, my Comments today may be somewhat unbalanced because most of those were more in Southeast Asia than Northeast. So let me hand over to Penny and the rest of the panel. I hope that set the stage. Penny, over to you. Ian, thank you. That was an excellent context setting introduction for all of us. Thinking back and reflecting on what have been the drivers of um, Asia Pacific economic growth over the last 40 years and in the post World War II period. Could I invite Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia to? Um, now offer his views on our topic for today. Thank you, Ambassador.
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm uh, grateful uh, to Ian also for uh, setting this stage uh, so brilliantly. Uh, I would like to say I'm delighted to be part of this very first panel at this very, very important uh, summit. Uh, first, very quickly, two brief comments on the theme of this session. I think uh, uh, those in business and also in the military affairs are quite uh, used to, to the idea or the concept of VUCA, uh, as was pointed out by Ian. But I would submit that uh, the uh, COVID impacted world is something very new, something very different, something that the world had never known before. Uh, I think it has truly been described, aptly been described as the greatest shock to the international system since the Second World War. So I think we have to take it in that spirit. And second comment on the theme is that while it talks about Asia Pacific economic cooperation, we, I think, are going to focus a bit more on the region rather than on the institution itself, although we, of course, uh, take note that Malaysia will host the APEC summit uh, later in the year. Now, in the probably six and a half minutes given to me, I'm going to submit to you uh, five uh, arguments with a view to trigger some discussion at the end. Uh, with due respect to everybody, I would first say that the concept of Asia Pacific is somewhat dated now. Uh, in much of the world, it has been replaced by the new concept of Indo-Pacific, which really is a pretty straightforward concept, which says that the development and security issues of the Pacific region and the Indian Ocean region are deeply interlinked. And therefore, they have to be looked at in a holistic manner uh, what is Indo-Pacific? I think we can say Indo-Pacific is Asia-Pacific plus India, plus maybe even more. There is a divergence of definitions among experts, something that it runs from uh, western shores of uh, the US all the way to eastern shore of Africa, whereas others take a more limited, narrow view. But that is not something that we need to we held up here. The central point is that Asia Pacific and India are interlinked and that is probably the reason why I'm part of this panel. My second point is uh, again to elaborate a little bit more about the impact of geopolitics on the future prospects of economic cooperation in our region. Uh, Ian spoke about it. I would like to present very briefly the Indian perspective here. I think uh, we have to put it as diplomatically, uh, but as candidly as possible. As seen from New Delhi, the overarching uh, feature is uh, China's assertive diplomacy and aggressive behavior, particularly on its periphery, stretching from the Eastern Ladakh on the India-China border through the South China Sea to Senkaku Islands and beyond. Watching with deep concern, the latest intrusions by PLA into the Indian territory, we in India are aware of the seriousness of this dimension. Uh, I think I can say that India's view is that this is the age of development and peace and harmony rather than expansionism and aggression. Uh, I believe that many others in the ASEAN region uh, share this view, they are concerned with what is happening in the past few months. Uh, and therefore, let me raise the basic question, which is this. Are we all working for a cooperative, inclusive, and peaceful Asian century and a multipolar Asia? Or are we now compelled to subscribe to the China dream and a unipolar Asia? This question demands deep reflection and debate because business prospects will depend on the answers. My third point is that India remains committed to closer economic cooperation with the region, even though it is stepped out, out of the negotiation for RCEP. So do we see a contradiction there? Uh, I think we have to be very frank to say that 
uh, India has to recognize that its decision has caused disappointment to many of our friends in the region. At the same time, I think they also ought to recognize that with some of them, with some of them and their stand, India was disappointed too. Uh, I think uh, India feels that um, India's legitimate concerns uh, were not uh, accommodated and our friends did not stand by us to some extent. We also feel that an RCEP without India would be like an aircraft with one wing. Maybe it can still fly, but a diminished RCEP will deny itself the benefits of access to a 1.3 billion strong market. I think that is a point our friends need to note. The fourth point is that India would still focus on the economic dimension. It is going to work closely with ASEAN and Japan. It's going to work on the sub-regional fora like BIMSTEC and Mekong Ganga cooperation. But most importantly, it is going to focus on developing the economic dimension of the Quad partnership involving US, Japan, Australia, and India. So that has to be not just a security or political partnership. It would be effective if it has an economic pillar. And I think in that respect, a number of initiatives are being taken. The latest being the supply chain resilience initiative, uh, which is uh, going to take a very clear shape shortly. Finally, I think uh, my last point relates uh, to a theme which is very close to, to our heart here in Delhi. Uh, and this uh, deals with the issue of blue economy. It's a theme of crucial importance, particularly I would like to relate it to the sustainability part uh, in the theme of this session itself. Uh, I think the COVID era has further validated the need for mankind to create additional uh, resources uh, for everybody's livelihood. Oceans offer that possibility but it will have to be done in a sustainable, sustainable and uh, environmentally friendly manner. And it is this kind of goal, it is this kind of objective that would need our working together. Uh, here in India, uh, a major industry chamber, we produced uh, uh, a recent report uh, which gives all the details and this can be made available through our chair to anybody who's interested, even in the e-form. The short point is that blue economy was appealing before the COVID era. It has now become uh, compelling in the COVID era. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and I'm very conscious of time. So if we could invite Professor Xiao Gong, the chairman of the Hong Kong Institution for International Finance now to share his views. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, uh, Penny. Uh, I think uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, there are a lot of change uh, happening. Uh, but I have to say that in the last 40 years, you know, uh, the world has been doing pretty well, largely because uh, the global uh, supply chains, uh, the declining transaction costs allow the world to become really uh, one market. And uh, China, I think India and every country, in, including the United States, benefited tremendously uh, in terms of living stance. However, uh, the inequality uh, because of the technology uh, also leads to a lot of social problems. Uh, and these social problems, I think, uh, has been used by some politicians you know, to uh, basically uh, ten, uh, uh, raising this so-called uh, uh, national security issue you know uh, we have a wonderful peaceful you know uh, 40 years but for now national security becomes uh, uh, a problem and uh, the shadow cost of national security used to be zero now is rising and uh, uh, so that is, is a problem because uh, in addition to this uh, 
man-made uh, geopolitical you know problems we also have a uh, uh, covid-19 you know which is uh, you know a sudden uh, threat to the humanity uh, and uh, unfortunately you know dealing with the pandemic uh, is a social cost issue you know uh, the market cannot solve it you know uh, the public health interventions we need uh, both the central government and the local government, you know, to really uh, uh, play a role. Uh, but fortunately for China, uh, I think uh, uh, China not only continue to go uh, towards the, the more open market oriented uh, uh, policy, but also within a very short period of time, mobilizing central local government, but most importantly, uh, you know, at the community level, uh, and uh, effectively using very low tech, uh, but very effective uh, social distancing, uh, uh, you know, uh, all kind of public health, uh, you know, uh, traditional uh, tools uh, have stopped uh, this pandemic, uh, at least within the border. Uh, and this is uh, important to basically backstop the slide of the global economy. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, China is becoming a, a major supply basis for the fight for COVID-19, you know. Uh, and also, uh, the, I think China contributed uh, uh, almost 30% of uh, net growth in the global economy, but now it, it's rising uh, uh, because the, uh, some other countries are not able to really uh, uh, deal with the pandemic, uh, uh, even though uh, it, it is... Uh, uh, actually, you, you can use very low tech, uh, you know, the, the tools, the methods we used 100 years ago, you know, are still effective. Uh, uh, but I think the attitudes, uh, because of the politics, uh, because of uh, domestic politics and the geopolitical politics, you know, are stopping, I think, the, the, the whole world to really, uh, to stop this uh, pandemic. Uh, and this is really the foundations uh, for the recovery of the global economy. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, China, although concerned about uh, uh, the national security or the geopolitics, uh, but I think China is now more confident uh, uh, in really continue to open uh, its economy. And uh, I think uh, uh, China sees that uh, the, the center of the global economy is shifting towards Asia. Uh, and uh, China, India, and also Southeast Asia, you know, the, the, the whole Asia uh, is really uh, becoming uh, the center of the global uh, economy. Uh, and I think uh, 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 China uh, recent policy, uh, what they call the, uh, the two circular, cycle, uh, circular uh, economies, one is domestic economy, uh, the other is external economy, but they emphasize that uh, uh, the circulation is market circulation. So China has been continue to uh, 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 open uh, its financial sector uh, and continue to uh, promote uh, uh, private business. Uh, uh, but I, I think uh, uh, because a lot of other countries are still uh, had problems, you know, dealing with the pandemic and particularly dealing with the social problems triggered by the pandemic. Uh, uh, and that uh, also affected uh, its economy. Uh, uh, I think this is a, a, a very difficult challenge because there are politicians, you know, uh, in the U.S. Uh, promoting uh, decoupling uh, uh, the global supply chain. And that would be a huge cost to the global economy uh, because a lot of the new technologies, they are very specialized. They are distributing uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, and no one country can independently really build anything uh, significant. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, the, the cost of national security, the cost of innovation, uh, you know, the cost of uh, continue to raise in living stands, and particularly the cost of uh, developing sustainable uh, economy, is going to be tremendous if we don't work together. And I personally think that the, the best place for really cooperation is in Asia, you know, in, in our region, you know, China, India, 
actually uh, works very well in the last uh, until recently. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in my personal view, it's not really necessary. You know, it's it's uh, you know we have a lot of things to do uh, to improve our living standards uh, and uh, to improve our sustainability. So I think that this sort of forums are extremely useful. Uh, so to uh, really understand each other. You know, I, I will stop here. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Penny. Yeah. Professor, thank you very much for those observations. That was very interesting. Um, could I now invite Dr. Eden Woon, who is joining us from Thailand, to share some perspectives. Thank you very uh, thank much. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Penny, and uh, uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm so sorry I'm not in uh, uh, KAL at this time. Uh, I was in KAL in October uh, at a conference uh, and uh, it was uh, extremely enjoyable. So hopefully uh, this in-person uh, meetings can take place uh, sometime in, uh, soon in 2021. Um, but um, uh, I, would, uh, I was very interested in what the previous uh, three speakers had to say because uh, uh, in case uh, you didn't look at my bio, I I did spend 22 years in the U.S. government, uh, and also uh, I spent uh, about 15 years uh, working in business uh, uh, in Asia. Uh, so I would love to comment on the three speakers, uh, but in the interest of time, uh, and also because now I am uh, in academia, uh, I will not comment on uh, what they said, but I will just focus on a very narrow subject. Um, and it's an important uh, uh, issue, uh, because it uh, has to do with how uh, Asia develops. In other words, the human resource uh, issue. Uh, as you know, of course, if you don't have people, you don't have uh, economy. Uh, so uh, uh, education, of course, is the key to producing uh, the right type of human resources uh, for, um, the, uh, uh, for, the, for the region or for the country or for the world. So I will focus on education in Asia and specifically I will focus on uh, higher education, uh, namely, uh, uh, you know, uh, after high school, uh, higher education, uh, uh, post-secondary school uh, education. And I will uh, propose a, um, a very simple uh, thesis, uh, and uh, this can be debated, uh, but um, I'll just put forth uh, on the table, is that I think that uh, COVID-19, uh, obviously, as the speakers have said, uh, is a tremendously uh, depressing uh, and uh, cataclysmic, uh, you know, impact uh, on the world uh, and on the region uh, and on every single country. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, with every crisis, you know, if you are a uh, uh, astute uh, business person uh, or in any organization, leader of any organization, you will look at a crisis and you should look at not only how you survive the crisis and you should look at how you come out of the crisis uh, in a new world uh, stronger and with uh, new thinking. And uh, so if you take that view, if you look ahead, I would say that the universities in Asia, okay, uh, and uh, I would count them as both the global universities in Asia, um, uh, main mainly the ones uh, which are uh, highly ranked, uh, and there are many of those uh, uh, in China, uh, there's many of those in uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, and also the regional universities, some very, very, uh, you know, uh, significant and respectable region, you know, regional universities uh, uh, in Asia. I think that both of these types of universities would gain coming out of the crisis. Uh, so that is my thesis, is that, is that uh, while universities around the world are now scrambling because of a disruption of supply chain, uh, of recruitment of students, because of new financial models need to be set up, uh, because of uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the prime goals of the last uh, a few decades for universities is internationalization. Uh, that is all uh, uh, thrown uh, uh, upside down because of the uh, air travel uh, uh, you know, restrictions. Um, despite all this, uh, I think that Asian universities would gain. And I will just briefly mention uh, you know, uh, several areas why I think that Asian universities would gain uh, coming out of the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And one, first of all, is on recruitment. I think that um, uh, everybody knows that many top Asian students uh, in the past uh, went to the West, okay? They went to UK, they went to Europe, they went to the United States, they went to Canada, uh, and they went to Australia, okay? 
Uh, and uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, partly because of uh, uh, travel reasons, uh, partly because of uh, geopolitical reasons, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, recruitment, uh, this one-way flow of students, top students, uh, is going to be severely curtailed. Uh, and uh, every day you hear news about uh, what the U.S. policy would do to Chinese students, for example. Uh, and uh, so as a result, I think that if the students don't go out west, they will stay in Asia and they will make the Asian university stronger. Because as you know, of course, universities are strong. The number one reason universities are strong and top ranked, as in the West, are because of students, okay? So if the top Asian students or the top Indian students stay in India uh, and all the IITs uh, would get uh, uh, the student body would, uh, would get these top students who uh, in the past may have gone to uh, out west. Uh, the top students in, uh, in uh, China, they would go to Tsinghua and Beida, Peking University, and, and maybe not to uh, you know, Princeton or Harvard uh, or MIT. Uh, and so that's number one. The recruitment, it benefits Asian universities. The second thing is that uh, the uh, talent flow in general, uh, there's, all, uh, there's already you know, plenty of anecdotal evidence that um, you know, uh, accomplished uh, Asian scientists uh, don't feel as welcome in some of the Western countries. Uh, and uh, work permits are more difficult to get. So as a result, uh, there's a, a indication that some of them who have very, been very successful uh, out West are beginning to come home. Uh, they come home either to academic institutions, uh, which is what we're talking about today, or they go into research uh, uh, departments uh, in companies. Uh, in any case, this is a talent flow uh, that is a reverse uh, brain drain, if you wish. So that's number two. And that actually boosts the status of the universities uh, uh, in Asia. Third is internationalization. Um, there's not going to be that many uh, exchanges back and forth. But, you know, my feeling is that with technology, uh, actually, you can uh, give more international global experience to more students uh, without traveling. And uh, I think that uh, uh, internet, uh, you know, the, the Zoom platform and, and digitization, uh, all that, uh, you know, is, is really underexplored uh, to uh, give students an, a global experience. No, it's not the same as being there. Uh, this is, uh, speaking from my home, is not the same as being in KL, but on the other hand, uh, it, uh, it actually goes quite a long ways, you'd be surprised, uh, to giving you international uh, experience. And then the fourth is uh, educational collaboration. I actually think that with um, uh, shorter travel times uh, being uh, uh, not uh, in favor, uh, longer travel times. So somebody goes away uh, to a university in Asia from the West, instead of going for three days and coming home, they may come for a year. And if they come for a year, uh, that actually would also boost the academic status of the universities uh, because one year visiting professor contributes a lot more uh, than just a, a three-day visit uh, with a, a colloquial, okay, uh, which we do need. But uh, in the absence of that, longer visits actually uh, does a lot of good. Research collaboration uh, can still take place. This is a tough one because, um, you know, you can't get together in laboratories or in, uh, in places uh, but again, with technology, uh, this can also be done. Uh, and also, I would su submit that there's a kind of uh, collaboration that can take place uh, more, which is what I would call complementary collaboration. In other words, Asia has a lot of issues, okay, on the ground, where Asian scientists and engineers are very well aware. Uh, but some of the top universities, say, in the West, have the leading edge technology. This type of applying, for example, applying AI to uh, agriculture, uh, applying uh, robotics uh, to uh, uh, look at uh, you know, earthquake prevention, uh, applying, uh, uh, again, uh, data science to uh, climate change, uh, you know, all the uh, on the ground issues in Asia complemented, paired together with technology uh, and leading edge technology for some of the top, uh, top ranked universities in the West. That kind of complementary collaboration uh, is something that I, I think would take place uh, uh, more. Uh, and finally, uh, regional um, uh, alliances. I think that uh, Japan universities will work closer with Southeast Asian universities. Indian universities would uh, 
would work closer with uh, universities in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Chinese universities, in other words, you look within the region and not just always, uh, you know, uh, first partner will be out west, okay, which is uh, uh, today, uh, that, that is sort of the phenomenon uh, right now. Uh, that's not to say there is no intra, there's plenty of intra-regional collaboration now, but I just think this will could be increased. And finally, my last word is that uh, the importance of Asia, okay, uh, whether you uh, talk about Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, whether you go from uh, uh, Timor-Leste all the way to uh, Iran, uh, you know, Asia is a formidable economic region and uh, economic regions need top universities. And so uh, if it's not going to be a totally global world uh, because of the various reasons, uh, you know, from pandemic to geopolitics, then Asia being a strong uh, continent itself, I think that bodes well also for the development of its universities. So I would just stop here and uh, just uh, uh, touch, I'm, uh, I apologize, uh, one narrow slice of uh, what uh, Asia economic development is, is about, uh, namely from the human resources and higher education point of view. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, Dr. Wim, thank you. And thank you very much for touching on that incredibly important slice as we move forward on regional economic collaboration, the human resources dimension, and particularly our higher education institutions have got an incredibly important role to play. So could we move to our last speaker, um, senior businessman, highly successful entrepreneur, Dr. Gaur Peng Wee. Thank you. Mr. Gore, you're mute. Hi. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I have a very simplistic worldview and always see it through the lenses of math math mathematics. And I would uh, start with uh, uh, Nash uh, non cooperative game theory. And that character characterizes most of the things that we are talking about today. Uh, whether it's social economic, uh, social uh, geopolitical, or social economy. Now, the the conclusion of uh, Nash non-cooperative theory, a game theory, is that everything will lead to paradoxes and dilemma. And so, irrespective of how we approach uh, the game, uh, we will always end up in paradoxes. Else. A dilemma. Now, I'll, I'll cut it short here about the geopolitical and social economical issues. I'm more interested about things which are more predictable and, and more certain, and that is about uh, regional cooperation, economy, and uh, uh, entrepreneurship, and so on. Now, I will start with, uh, with economy. Now, because the world has two important drivers. One is the economic driver, and the other one is the mathematical models. Now, if you look at uh, the whole history of humankind, uh, without Newton's law, actually we drag along for thousands of years. And without Maxwell equation, uh, we would be uh, still uh, seeing each other somewhere, uh, maybe walking, uh, maybe uh, well, taking a car or ship but uh, for several days, and then move on to quantum uh, uh, physics, which are all mathematical models, now which are more difficult topic to, to handle. So I will start with economic model, which is much easier. Now, from mathematical point of view, everything is about natural responses to our choices. So it is all our choices that leads to certain mathematical models that we call Newton's law. That's, we call it Maxwell's law. But whatever it is, it was more for economic reasons. And so economic, economy is more or less driven by choices and mathematical models. Now the important thing that led, led to today's uh, so-called disruption or BUCA is actually 
digitization, which started because of US printing money in 1972. Now, which many people thought is, was negative, but actually it was that printing of money that was invested in the very large integrated circuit uh, that was in 1972. And I worked on chip design in 1978, which was uh, uh, just the right time because at that time, we barely able to use computer to look at what happened in a microchip. And uh, that investment in the electronics, and mind you, in 1972, very large integrated circuit uh, uh, invention was not in US GDP. That means many people didn't even think it, is Im it was important. Now, but uh, the combination of the capital plus uh, the, the electronic design led to today's uh, advancement that we call digitization. And uh, of course that led to many social problems and opportunities, geopolitical and social economic problems and opportunities. So if you want to look at the problems, there, there are lots of problems. You want to look at opportunity, opportunities, there are a lot of opportunities. Now, so uh, the, the, the economic driver uh, was actually initiated by USA. And, uh, and, and we should say thank you to USA. But the problem started uh, just very recently that when the model start to move, the economic model start to move from the supply side. Why? Because Sciences is always a curve of diminishing return. Newton's law, until a certain point, it become a law of diminishing the return. Maxwell's law, until a certain point, become law of diminishing return. And so every, all the surprise side, with the mathematical model, we expect it to be law of diminishing return, which means the surprise side will hit a curve that no matter how much money you pour in, you're not going to get very good return. And and uh, the, economic, the economic principle, uh, the economic equation is going to be more biased to the demand side. And that is the beginning of every problem today that we have today because uh, US is not going to invest the money for China because obviously China drives the demand side with huge population and uh, a lot of noisy people who are willing to use mobile phone for six hours. And there's a lot of economy. And, and you may not like it, but it is a huge demand and it's going to drive what you design and how you design things. Now, I'm going to move on uh, fast forward to digitization, the mathematical model side of things, because uh, we, we are short of time. I'm going to give a brief uh, history of what I did so that uh, we'll cover a bit of entrepreneurship. Now, I wrote, uh, I, I did, as I said, I did chip design. And then uh, 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 move on uh, to IBM. And in 1988, I wrote a general theory on uh, digitization, and which is actually not that very difficult. If you read mathematics, it's basically a uh, game, game uh, field theoretic model, plus group theoretic model, semi-group theoretic model, and a ca categorical model. Now, these four models combine, you basically practically describe the world inclusive of God, which is interesting, right? Now, uh, with that, with that, I started my first businesses, the first business, and then went on to invest in 129 businesses. Why? Because I would like to cover every aspect of uh, human life. Ultimately, I'm a researcher, not really a good businessman. Now, I would like to see how this digitization is going to affect our life. And uh, of course, it's going to affect every aspect of our life. And it has, it has already as affect the geopolitical side of things, the social economic side of things. What about the individuals? Now, coming to the individual side, I think the one that is going to cause a lot of problems is education. Uh, as Einstein said, the worst thing to science is education. 
because it costs you to be experience based rather than uh, 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 based on your instinct or intuition. And that, 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 that definitely takes out a large portion of creativity. Our experience based mm -hmm. model is very, very narrow. If you look at, uh, if you compare with the mathematical models, which has uh, uh, thousands, zillions of dimensions compared to three, four dimensions of experience base. Now, so our education has largely been as, ex, uh, experience based. We actually teach students to remember things and we test them and we say something is right and something is wrong, which is weird. I always, I ask in my high school, why one plus one has to be two? I, I couldn't understand why it has to be two because a, 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 a girl and a man, they married and they got a, a few children and it's not two, it's not one plus one equal to two, it's one plus one equal to 11. And, and, and so something is wrong somewhere. And that is based on institu uh, intu intuitive thinking. But if you are coming from experience base, your teacher would say, well, it's too, sorry, you're, it's too bad, it's too. And, 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 and our current, uh, our current uh, education is actually based on something called a joint model. And that is going to, not going to do very fair work, very well in this uh, so-called demand or mathematical model world. And uh, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, whether it is in terms of uh, uh, geopolitical issues, whether it's social economic issues, finally, education has a large part to play. And, uh, and so we finally come in the big circle that, uh, that we are in a VUCA war. And how are we going to solve this uh, VUCA war? Finally, it's going to be education. And it is going to be all the research people and uh, entrepreneurs who are willing to, to contribute to, 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 to uh, better models of teaching, better, better, better models of researchers. And that, that I think can help the world. And uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, based on Nash non-cooperative game theory, that every, the truth is nobody cooperate, cooperate with each other. Uh, nobody cooperate with anyone. We always thought that we cooperate with people. No, we never. We always live our life. Every one of us live our life. And it is the combination of, of our models that actually move the world forward. And therefore, human beings are always paradoxical and always ended up in dilemma that have to make difficult choices. But one thing for sure, mathematical model says nature has a say. The nature, nature has a big say. And so this is the part that I think we have to focus a lot. What nature tells us. I think I will conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank our distinguished panel today for raising an incredibly broad set of issues and offering some distinctive perspectives on what are both the opportunities and the challenges for us going forward in terms of regional economic integration and further growth post COVID. And with that, could I invite you all to thank our distinguished panelists this morning? Thank you very, very much.